real estate developers and investments on both sides of the border. And we specialize in industrial uh, real estate. So that's our core business. Basically, we develop industrial in Monterrey and North Mexico, and we also develop industrial uh, real estate along I-35 from Dallas all the way to Laredo. So I think it's, um, these are one of my favorite topics, industrial real estate and AI, and how uh, we kind of heard from uh, uh, the previous speakers on the integration that we're gonna be seeing now. So they were looking at the, the So what I'm gonna be talking about today is these two big forces that we're seeing. One is called nearshoring, and the second one is called AI. So we'll start first with nearshoring, and I think this is a topic that is not new by now, but it's just a giant, and the tariffs are holding it off a little bit, but if you go down to Mexico, that is not stopping companies from making these investments. The companies down there, real estate developers, uh, pension funds are still investing in industrial real estate and manufacturing just because we need to catch up. And this is actually, the tariffs, I believe is a good thing for the Mexican side of real estate because they need to do a lot of catching up. Um, that could be uh, something that could be a hurdle down there um, just because from a capital standpoint, the capital availability down there is a lot different than what we have up here in the United States. The capital markets, it's one of the biggest hurdles uh, down in Mexico. Thankfully, the industrial sector, uh, specifically the real estate industrial sector, benefits from a lot of U.S. companies and pension funds being down there for a long time. We got the Logis, we got Blackstone, all these really big funds that have been participating for a long time down there. So it has helped the flow of capital, specifically in industrial real estate, but nothing comparing to what we have here in the U.S., uh, let alone in Texas. So that's one uh, big thing that we're living through right now and that we're gonna keep living through the next um, decade. The other thing is AI and how uh, everything is evolving with AI and physical AI. I think I was having a, a conversation yesterday with, with a friend that, that manages a hedge fund and he uses AI in order to basically do all the trading and he's producing really attractive returns. And it's it just, at some point, it's scary on what AI can do and we cannot even phantom of the future of AI. So we kind of have to be really adaptive to what's coming and really be open-minded so that we can see where the opportunities lie. I mean, where it, it really see examples on whatever the, Something took uh, me um, to write a market research report a week. Now it takes me a couple of hours. And if people are not adapting to that, they will get left behind in a little bit. That can get compounded in time. So these two really big forces are competing in uh, what we're calling the, the corridor, the I-35 corridor, all the way between Monterey, it was starting the manufacturing, crossing the border to the rail and going all the way up to Dallas, which is a really big distribution hub out there. So let's start with a little bit more on just painting the picture on uh, the industrial real estate sector in Mexico, uh, specifically in more in North Mexico. So. Uh, during the past 24 months, we have seen $30 billion of investments related to manufacturing and real estate. These are all companies, uh, a lot of them, actually the, the Association of Mexican Industrial Parks published some of these figures 
and I think it's around 50% uh, of, of the companies that are selling um, shop down there are United States companies. So that's one of the, the biggest clients. Um, and the rest is a mix of European and Asian companies. But the US is, is number one. Um, absorption of 12 million square feet. So just to put that into perspective, the, um, the absorption on a good year that we have here in Austin is about 4 million square feet. Uh, Dallas, the size of the industrial market is a billion square feet and in Monterey is 200 million square feet and they both did the same amount of absorption of square feet. So Monterey has seen a peak of industrial real estate absorption from all these people that are going to uh, Mexico to set up their, their companies down there. What's the result? Less than 1% vacancy. So that's why I'm saying that I think Terrace is giving us a little bit of time to catch up, to invest in infrastructure, to invest in real estate, to invest in all the things needed in order to capture this new way of demand of real estate. So on just also how, what's the, the ripple effect over here? And uh, David um, touched uh, on this. So eventually most of the products that get produced in Mexico, they are here for, they, they come to the US. They, they're, the US is the biggest consumer of Mexican uh, produced uh, products there. So they go to Laredo, uh, as, as David said. So I think it's like one more than a million dollars crossing every minute into the US coming from Mexico. So you can imagine just the, the dimension and the volume that, that is expecting. If you have never been to Laredo, I really recommend you go down there. It's amazing to see the growth that it has, the amount of warehouses and just a logistical hub that I think it's probably unique in that sense, uh, at least in the United States and, and maybe by comparing it to other cities in, in Asia, I think it's a really um, potential, uh, it, it has a lot of potential, but still it, it's a, a great thing that, that we got uh, here in Texas. Um, so the next thing, the second course, just to expand a little bit more on this, well, just an, another important fact to mention there is that 80% of the U.S. companies are actively planning or in the process of reshoring or nearshoring their operations. So that's between reshoring to Mexico or to the U.S. So this is still, people are still evaluating. You can imagine how these really big companies take a lot of time in order to make this decision, make these transitions, but it's something that still has a long way to go. So I think we, we, there's just so much availability of the information of nearshoring and we feel that it has been here for a while, but it's the, the volume and the magnitude that we're seeing, it, it's a really big way that I don't think we can really fathom the, the, the impact that it's going to have. So just moving on to how AI is gonna impact the, the real estate uh, sector here. For example, the site selection is, is going to be really different. Before, we just focused on land, and let's try to sell somewhere where we're going to have availability of labor. Now, that everything is about the power, as, as David mentioned. It's so important to be close to power because the demand of power that these warehouses are going to need is nothing that, that would, like we have right now. So having uh, connectivity to data and connectivity to the grid, that's one of the most important things. So from that point, it's changing the perspective of how you're looking for land. That, that, that changes it dynamically. Um, yeah, really, really important. So the other thing is the building design. So we need to start thinking about the, all the robotics and the different components that we're gonna be seeing within these warehouses. You're gonna be needing what, what we call super flat floors. And that's a level of um, 
um, exactitude of the floors in order for the robots to work with the composition that they need. That takes uh, a lot of investment, a lot of technology, and I mean, remember that these workhouses are more than 100,000 square feet uh, in size. So, I mean, uh, 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 an angle uh, uh, or a degree, or even a fraction of a degree in change of the floor changes the, your, your whole operation of the building. So, even small things like that, uh, we're going to be needing to focus a little bit more. So, uh, between the site selection access to good infrastructure and also the design that we need to think how the end users, which are going to be robots, are going to be using these warehouses, starts to change everything. And, and now we're not focusing, uh, we're starting to focus more on dense industrial warehouses. So instead of your regular uh, 30 clear height industrial warehouses, we're going to be looking at 90 uh, feet. Uh, clear height, just because their robots are able to work a lot more vertically and you don't have that much real estate and it's, uh, it's a lot more efficient from a, a capital standpoint to build vertical there. Um, so that's some other things to, uh, to consider. So the other thing is now how these warehouses are going to be operating. Now we talked about how we select them, we talked about how we design them and how they're going to be operated. So again, this is where the data and connectivity and the Wi-Fi are going to be really important. Uh, these are going to be state-of-the-art. Um, uh, the internet of, of things with all the equipment is going to be talking to each other. So there's things like the, the digital twins, which uh, I don't know if you guys have, have heard about this, but they basically work um, and, and um, they, they um, make the, the workflow a lot more efficient and they can save a lot of time. Um, also, uh, the, the buildings become uh, a lot more valuable just because there's so much infrastructure in them and there's so much capital in them that uh, it's not only about real estate, it's everything that actually produces the end goods and the increases the production. So it's real estate plus all that increases the productivity of within the building. So next we'll talk a little bit about the, the challenges um, and then uh, the, the opportunities here. But the, so we'll focus first on the, the challenges of real estate. So this mostly applies to Mexico. Um, uh, this is a really big topic industrial real estate and manufacturing in Mexico is the, the availability of power. We're, we're struggling with that a lot. The, the new president uh, has been doing a lot of work in order to um, expand the system and the grid, but also open it up to maybe more private investment because they know that they don't have the capital and also they are not as efficient as the private sector in order to improve the grid and have the availability of power that will be needed there. So that's one really big thing. The construction cost, I mean, and especially skilled labor, uh, I think that's also gonna be a challenge that we'll need to, to focus on. Uh, so that's also something that, that um, it's a challenge I think for both sides of the border um, and then the, also actually finding the sites that have this infrastructure ready. I, I, we know that there's a lot of investment going on here in the US. Uh, I think there's more than trillion dollars of you know, AI investments, which obviously encompasses a lot more related to the electricity and all the other infrastructure critical on the AI. Uh, and then, so just moving on to the physical challenges, it just, it's a lot more expensive, so more capital. Thankfully, the US is a big hub for this type of investment, and it's the leader. So there's a lot of foreign uh, investment companies starting also to be interested in the sector, and there's more availability of capital. So I'll, I'll move on just uh, from a management perspective to the opportunities there. Uh, so we need to change the mindset or how we start to um, see the value of real estate, that's how I was saying. Thank you so much.